Hi guys, today we're going to wrap up uh, this series on fabrics with skins and synthetics and sort of mashing these two together. Uh, so let's begin. So skins and synthetics. So we're going to start off with some skins. Uh, so leather. Um, and leather refers to fabric that is made from the skin of any animal. It's gone through a tanning process. Uh, so the animal is skinned, the hair is removed, and the hide is processed with chemicals uh, to produce a very durable, thick, uh, long-lasting fabric. Um, and it is used uh, to make garments, but it's used to make a variety of different things. Um, anything that needs to be sort of durable, maybe a little bit flexible. So, um, of course, it's used in upholstery. We can have uh, leather uh, upholstered furniture. Uh, it's used to create small leather goods, of course, so belts, uh, straps for watches, um, wallets, purses, shoes, uh, things like that. Um, and indeed, there are many synthetic varieties of leather. Uh, it's becoming more and more popular today. Um, the, I guess, preferred sort of uh, marketing for a synthetic le leather used to be um, faux leather, which really just means fake leather, um, but they put faux in French to make it sound a little fancier. Uh, but now they are calling it vegan leather, um, which uh, it, it's really all the same stuff and it's made out of synthetic fiber. Um, but true leather comes from the hide of an animal and we can pretty much do the tanning process to any animal that we choose. However, there are many animals that are more prevalent than others, but of course uh, we have the ability to make leather out of pretty much anything with skins. Um, so uh, even fish, uh, I haven't included fish on here, but fish leather is, well, there is one type of fish leather, um, but even fish, the only thing we really can't make um, leather out of is, is insects. Um, but anything else with a skin and not an exoskeleton, we, we can make leather out of. Um, so let's see some of the processes and what to know about our leathers. So the most prevalent leather out there is cow's leather. And it's really a byproduct of the beef industry. Uh, and I mean that to say, um, Obviously, we um, breed cows for milk, we breed cows for uh, meat, um, but whenever we kill a cow for meat or we, uh, a dairy cow reaches the end of its life, um, it's ended. And so um, it's rather wasteful to just throw away the skin. Uh, so instead, we tan it and use it for leather. And the prevalence of cow's leather is really just a reflection of um, how much we like to eat the cow. Um, so for every cow that is made into cheeseburgers and steaks, we still take that leather um, and use it, uh, take the skin to make it uh, into leather. It's a way of utilizing all the pieces of the uh, cow and not to be wasteful. Um, so <clears throat> in a way, as long as people are going to be eating beef and drinking milk, uh, we will have a prevalence of cow's leather. Um, over here, we're just uh, sort of shows a little bit about um, values of leather and quality of leather and where the best qualities are produced. So up here is the best quality right here on sort of the, the lower part of the back. Um, and it's about 13% of the hide we can use for the best value of leather. Um, Moving outward, it kind of radiates out in quality. 30% of the hide surrounding that area uh, is sort of a second grade leather. Then we rotate out the largest portion of the cow is a sort of third grade leather. leather. And then from the sort of legs and neck, we get um, a, um, uh, a sort of low grade, um, uh, poor quality leather. So um, when talking about leather, it's really, um, and talking about especially grades of leather, not just the quality or value of leather before, it depends on what part of the hide is used. And this is a sort of cross, cross section of uh, a skin of an animal, and it shows sort of the composition, um, and these are called fibers, and they're kind of like sort of skin fibers in a way. 
um, of the actual height of the animal. So the flesh of the animal starts down here, and this is sort of the top layer of the skin. And depending on what layers are used in the le uh, leather, um, we can use it for different grades. So full grain or a sort of very high grade of leather, uh, just use these top layers. Uh, split is the bottom, top grain is sort of the uh, middle sort of part here with uh, a little bit of the corium and any sort of genuine leather is here. So a lot of people see the trademark genuine leather um, and oh, genuine leather, it kind of sounds quite nice, but it's, it's really kind of the cheapest, lowest grade that we have um, that can still be considered, you know, like leather. Leather finishes. So just like with our um, woven fabrics, um, leathers can uh, have a variety of different finishes. So let's take a look at them. And first we have an embossed leather and we had embossed fabrics before. And the process is very, very similar. So much like embossed fabric, embossed leather is made by passing hot engraved rollers or sometimes just individual stamps, uh, metal stamps over leather to stamp in a pattern texture. And these uh, uh, rollers are very, very hot, and produce a lot of steam, uh, and they sort of stamp in this pattern texture into this, the face of the leather. Many times this method is used to make cow's leather or other sort of cheaper types of leather look like it was made from another exotic animal. For example, up here, this is a cowhide. However, it's been dyed and embossed to look like alligator skin. Down here, we've just used the embossing technique to create a pretty pattern stamped into the leather. Patent leather. So this is a very famous finish, especially for shoes, but can be used for um, other garments as well. We typically see it done in black, red, or sometimes white, but really you can have patent le leather in any colors. Uh, for some reason, these are just the most popular colors I've seen, but you can have patent leather in any color. Um, and again, we, we use it a lot in shoes, dress shoes. This is a sort of tuxedo shoe, but we can use it in pumps and Mary Janes. Um, any sort of black, shiny, uh, or colored shiny shoe or garment is uh, we call patent leather. There's synthetic varieties, of course, I can say that for everything there's synthetic varieties, but true patent leather is made from leather um, that has a very high gloss finish applied to it. And this makes the leather very, very shiny and almost mirror-like. You can start to see reflections in it, it's so shiny. Um, in addition, the patent, uh, uh, in addition to the sort of shiny gloss finish that the patent leather finish uh, gives the fabric, it also makes the le leather very waterproof, almost entirely waterproof, um, which is why it's so popular for shoes. Suede. So suede is a leather with a soft napped face. Um, it's not uh, quite as shiny as our other leathers, and it kind of has this little texture. And uh, we also, you know, we can sometimes brush it one way and it's one color, brush it another way, it's another color, um, depending on how long that nap is. And um, it's leather just like any other, it's just finished uh, to have the face uh, be from the underside of the skin instead of the top side of the skin. And that's how it gets its soft finish. Um, and it can be made from any type of leather, but usually it's made from lambskin. Lambskin is a little bit softer, and we'll get to lambskin later. Specialty leathers. Alligator and crocodile. So leather from these animals has long been commonly used for accessories. Um, and not only because the hides of these animals provide a very beautiful and interesting texture uh, due to their scales, um, but because they are scales and, you know, they're uh, reptiles and not normal mammalians, uh, their hides and leather have a natural shine and they're very durable and waterproof as well, especially the alligators and crocodiles, as you can tell, they spend a lot of time in the water and so their skins themselves are very used to uh, standing up to wetness, moisture and water. So very strong, very durable, very pretty. Um, today, alligators are very common in southern U.S., so alligator skin is still used as a luxury leather in many products. Um, I can't say quite so much for crocodiles, 
Um, we can still get a skin from crocodile, but they're not quite as prevalent. They're also a lot bigger and meaner <laughs> than alligators. Uh, we typically have alligator farms, but we don't typically have crocodile farms. And especially just in the US, with the prevalence of alligators both in farms and in the wild, we'll typically in the US see alligator skin instead of crocodile skin. And here we have the hide, the animal, and um, one of its many uses to make a uh, wallet. Now, it can be very difficult to tell the difference between an embossed uh, cow hide made to look like an alligator hide, um, uh, as opposed to telling a genuine alligator hide. Uh, you can kind of tell a little bit with the formation of the scales. They should have like a little bit more raised um, areas and, and sort of almost like little textures coming in. It's very, it can be very difficult, very um, nicely embossed. It's really easy to tell when it's kind of a cheap embossing, but a really high quality embossed cow's leather can be almost indistinguishable from an alligator. You really have to be an expert to tell the difference. Um, but fortunately for us, most embossed leathers aren't really that high quality and you can kind of really tell the difference, especially in comparison to a genuine hide. Ostrich. This is kind of an odd one. But ostrich leather is also commonly used as a luxury leather and featured kind of a pimpled, bumpy texture. Um, although this leather is perfectly fine, it's good, it's soft, it's durable, it has an interesting texture, so it checks all of our boxes for, um, you know, a good uh, hide to use for a leather. It really is kind of like the cow. Um, we farm ostriches uh, in America and other places. Um, as a sort of specialty meat. So ostrich is a, an alternative to beef. Um, it's leaner and um, has a little bit of a different flavor. And uh, their feathers are often used as, you know, uh, in hats or as accessories themselves uh, in garments to trim. They're very f big, they're very fluffy, they're very floaty. So um, in a way, the le ostrich leather is a sort of byproduct um, of the ostriches being farmed for their feathers and for their meat, not necessarily for their leather. However, it's gained um, some popularity recently and we'll see it used quite commonly as a luxury leather um, for belts and shoes and wallets, all the sort of different places that we typically see luxury leathers uh, being used. And of course, again, as a sort of byproduct, um, you know, in the alligator, we do eat alligator in America. I've had it, it's actually not too bad. Um, it's common snack down in Louisiana. Um, pretty good, but ostrich leather, again, we want to make sure that if we are killing an animal that we use all parts of it to not be wasteful. So the leather has come as a sort of byproduct of farming it for its feathers and for its meat. Next is lamb. Uh, known as lambskin leather, uh, this, it is the leather harvested from a young sheep. Um, this leather is, is very, very coveted. It's a little bit more expensive but it's um, a, a little bit more lightweight than a lot of our other leathers. It's a lot more limp and soft, stretchy and supple, um, which makes it really, really excellent for any sort of leather garment that needs to have a little bit of stretch or is going to be close fitting in any way. Um, so we see it used in gloves. Uh, most gloves, especially kind of very fitted, kind of tight gloves are made out of lambskin. Um, and here too, we see an excellent application of lambskin, these sort of leggings. Um, uh, again, you really couldn't use that, uh, make those leggings out of many other types of leathers because they lack the sort of softness, suppleness, and pliability, and that little bit of stretch. All leathers have a little bit of stretch that they gain over time, um, but lambskin really is very pliable. Um, it's also very similar to another type of leather called calfskin um, that we really just take from a very young cow. However, lambskin is just more of all of these, you know, adjectives right here. Calfskin is soft, supple, and pliable, but lambskin is just, you know, kind of um, uh, the epitome of soft, supple, pliable leather. Snakeskin. So we can make snakeskin leather out of any type of snake. Um, however, more uh, snakes are a little bit more endangered or harder to get or more dangerous to cultivate um, than others. 
um, and uh, we can use the snakeskin is very coveted because of its highly ornate patterning. So this is really um, one of those uh, situations where we are not harvesting the snake skin as a byproduct. Um, we don't really eat snake meat that much. We don't use it for anything else. Um, we don't farm snakes, so to say, so to speak. We can um, farm some of them for skins, and we'll talk about that. Um, but this is really just because the snake has these gorgeous, beautiful patterns in their scale, and they can be used uh, to make uh, very beautiful shoes or belts or jackets or, or really anything um, and the design of snakeskin is really so coveted that it is replicated um, many many times so we can print or emboss leather to make it look like snakeskin a lot of times we print just woven fabrics or knit fabrics with a snakeskin pattern because it's so beautiful uh, the most common type of snakeskin seen uh, today used in shoes or you know wherever you're going to use it is python uh, so pythons are very easily raised in captivity and grow quite large, so they can provide rather a lot uh, of leather in, you know, for one animal. Rattlesnake skin is also commonly seen in the American Southwest, as this animal is seen as sort of dangerous and a nuisance, and it has really beautiful sort of patterns, especially the diamond back rattlesnake has a really gorgeous uh, diamond pattern down its skin. Um, and it's, uh, again, seen as a sort of a nuisance animal and it is venomous and quite dangerous. So people are very keen to sort of get rid of it. And since you're getting rid of, getting rid of it anyways, you may as well, um, you know, keep the skins and use it for something uh, to make something out of. Uh, and here we have some very common uses for snakeskin, snakeskin shoes, um, female and male versions. And these are both made out of Python. Stingray. So this one might surprise someone, uh, some people. This actually surprised me when I first saw my first stingray hide. Um, stingray leather comes from the stingray. Uh, it's a flat fish. Um, it's also called a skate. Um, its leather is bumpy and features a light diamond. Now, this is sort of what it looks like naturally. Um, some are more uh, defined than others. I believe when you see something like this, a lot of times, uh, if something is going to be made out of stingray leather, uh, they try to highlight that white diamond as a sort of design feature. I think this one got a little help by dyeing. Um, typically, it's a little bit more subtle. You do see them a little bit more defined than this. This is not very well defined, but you can kind of see the diamond here. Um, but it has this kind of all over kind of bumpy pebbly texture. The texture is very, very rounded. It's hard to tell from these pictures, but it's very, very round, the bumps. Um, and again, is used in all places that we commonly see specialty leathers used. Beaver tail. Uh, so beaver tail is made from the long flat tail of the beaver and it has a flat scaled texture. Um, here's some of the hinds that still sort of um, indicate the shape of the beaver tail and dyed in a few different colors. Um, like all leathers, it comes from uh, 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 small scale, like all leathers that come from smaller scale hides, this leather is usually to make, used to make shoes, wallets, belts that use less amount of leather. So that concludes our leathers. Let's skip on over to furs. Um, and I just want to take an instance now just to sort of mention um, a, a lot of people have take issue to both leathers and furs uh, because of the fact that animals do have to be killed to create these fabrics. Um, it's not like our wool section where the animals are just given a little haircut and sent on their merry way to grow more hair. Um, in all instances of leathers and furs, the animal is killed um, uh, because when they skin, they don't really tend to last long without their skin. Uh, so there is a lot of moral objection to how this fabric is created and not just the fact that animals have to give up their lives to do this, but especially what we see in the fur industry is they're raised under some pretty awful conditions. Uh, so they are bred and raised in pretty terrible conditions, have a pretty awful life, uh, and then a lot of times are not killed 
uh, humanely and their fur and skins are not harvested humanely. Um, so people have a very big objection to this. Um, that doesn't mean that animals can't be raised humanely for fur. Um, just, you know, like in all situations, it's a little bit more time, a little bit more money, and a little bit more effort to do so. And so people are looking to cut corners, um, don't really care about the welfare of animals, and are willing to save some time and some money by foregoing those sort of hum humanitarian efforts, um, or humane efforts, uh, uh, and not according, uh, giving them to the animals. Again, not true in all cases, and fur has had a long history um, in almost every single human culture. It has been utilized for garments or, or some sort of accessory. Um, but today, of course, with all of our alternatives, and especially synthetic alternatives, people are turning away from genuine leather, or actual, I shouldn't say genuine leather, but uh, real hide leather and real um, fur. Um, especially so in America and a lot of um, uh, other places in North America. Other cultures geographically are still A-OK -okay with fur. It's been a long part of their history. Um, I'm gonna single out particularly Russia. So Russia is very cold. Um, fur is incredibly warm. Real fur is incredibly warm. You cannot make a warmer garment out of anything else than real fur. And different animals might be warmer than others. Um, but if, again, if you're living in a very cold climate, um, you kind of have this performance necessity that fur gives that you might not be willing to give up. Also, it might be rooted a little bit more deeply in your culture. Uh, to wear fur because of your climate or because of, um, you know, different societal traditions. Um, so everybody sort of is either, you know, still, it's still there, people still wear fur, you can still buy fur. Um, it's just more or less popular depending on where you are. And it depends on your customer as well. Um, if your customer is someone that is concerned about animal rights, it, I would go with the synthetic fur. Um, if it's someone it, that is not um, concerned uh, with the, uh, you know, animal rights um, and either needs the warmth of fur or desires the um, luxury of fur. So fur has also long been a sort of status symbol. It's very expensive um, compared to sort of everything else. Um, uh, and we'll see there's a sliding scale for that, but furs generally are very, very expensive. Um, before the sort of modern age, um, if you had a fur coat or were able to buy a fur coat, um, it was a sort of a symbol that you've made it in life and you'd have that fur coat for the rest of your life. You may inherit it, you would insure it. Um, even still today, if you get home insurance or property insurance, uh, one of the largest categories of insurance for, um, you know, owned property is furs. Um, and, and again, they are, they can be very, very expensive. Um, and again, just like leather, we can create fur garments out of pretty much anything with fur, but I'm just going to go over some of the traditionally most commonly seen furs. Uh, I want to start with hair on hides. They're not a true fur. They're more closely related to our leathers. Um, and hair on hides refers to any skin that is typically used for leather, but has the animal's fur still on it. We typically see hair on hides um, made from cow, horse, or deer hides. Often these hides are printed with markings of other animals to mimic them. So these are two examples. We have a horse on hide from a pinto horse and a cow hide hair on. Um, and we can make skirts with these and jackets and different things like this. And it really, we kind of should have been more in the category of leather than it is a true fur. Typically when we see true fur garments, they're much furrier. Mink. A mink is probably one of the most classic uh, furs made for coats or we can make wraps or different things. Um, and mink is sort of a weasel-like animal 
looks like here, kind of like between a, a ferret and a, well, very close to a ferret. Um, and when one thinks of the classic fur coat, they're typically thinking of a, a mink fur coat. Now, like with all furs, um, most of the time we're going to see them in their natural colors. Um, but we have the technologies to dye them any color. So you can have a hot pink mink um, if you so desire. But again, typically the natural coloring of the animal um, is very nice. As we see here, it's very chocolatey. Um, uh, so we typically see furs, especially um, natural furs um, made from animals. Uh, in their natural colors, undyed, but of course we can dye them. We can also shear them, cut them, do all sorts of different things. So a lot of times we'll see minks or different colors uh, with patterns sort of cut into the fur um, to give it an extra cut of uh, texture or patterning um, to enhance the sort of beauty of the coat or garment. Fox. So fox fur is made from fox. So um, you know, it's, it, there's really no mystery where th these furs are coming from. We're going to name them uh, and label them uh, by the animal that they come from. Uh, and fox fur is made typically from farmed foxes that don't have the reddish color that we associate with wild foxes. Uh, the fox has long been prized for its fur, especially its very, very fluffy tail uh, that can be made into puffy details on fur garments. Rabbit. So a wide variety of rabbits can be bred for fur use and are very popular uh, in use in the fur industry. Um, uh, I'd say a, a, the majority of furs that we can see that are, are from natural um, animals are actually from rabbits. And like all furs, rabbit furs can also be dyed in a variety of different colors. Chinchilla. Chinchilla is often regarded as the softest fur, fur available to make into fur coats. And if you've ever felt it, you'll know why. It just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's unimaginably soft, really. Um, it's hard to believe when you're touching chinchilla that anything could possibly be so soft. Um, you probably have never touched anything so soft in your life. I certainly have never touched anything softer than chinchilla in my life. Um, however, the chinchilla is very small, um, so you have to kill an awful lot of them to make anything. Uh, and this makes the garments made from chinchilla very, very expensive. Um, it's probably one of the most expensive furs today. Um, traditionally, there were more expensive ones um, that were related to sort of the exotic nature or rarity of a animal. Um, uh, thankfully, there have been many, many restrictions put in place that um, restrict and uh, prohibit uh, people from creating garments made from very exotic or endangered animals. So um, classically, if you look back at sort of vintage uh, garments, we'll see fur jackets made from snow leopards, made from tigers, made from uh, jaguars and cheetahs and things like that. Um, and that was really because they have all these lovely patternings. Of course, we use that animal print many times um, in different fabrics, but of course we can just take the print and print it on. We don't have to harm the animals. Um, but due to, you know, uh, fashion's impact in, cre uh, you know, endangering these species, um, very, very uh, strict restrictions have been put into place to limit them. And we can no longer find things like a snow leopard coat on the market, thankfully. However, the chinchilla is very, it's, it's actually a pet, uh, much like a hamster or a gerbil. Um, uh, so it's easily farmed. It's not endangered in any way. Um, so this is now probably the most expensive uh, fur that you can still find on the market. Um, uh, just for an example, this jacket here is retailing at Nemus Marcus, uh, Neiman Marcus for about a little over $44,000. A little bit out of my price range. Um, but again, this sort of ties into the fact that fur is a status symbol. So you'll see a lot of times celebrities or musicians or athletes, very wealthy people, wear chinchilla simply as a way to say, I got a whole bunch of money. Look at this. I just spent, you know, 50 grand on a jacket. All right. Um, again, there's lots of other furs to be used. I just wanted to go over the main ones. Um, but now I'd like to go over synthetics. Now the synthetic section I have here is going to be relatively short. 
Um, I went over a sort of nice overview of synthetics in my fabrics of the world. So if you want a little bit of a closer look at each one of our synthetics, I would go back and watch that. Um, and, you know, we'd be here all day if I had to go over all synthetic fabrics because pretty much synthetics were invented and are used as um, a substitute for natural fibers. So all fabrics that I have covered in all previous videos have some sort of synthetic alternative. So any sort of cotton fabric, wool fabric, or whatever has its version that is done in synthetic as well. And it is it has the same sort of properties of the fabrics. It might not have all the same properties of the natural fiber. Like uh, we don't have the same sort of insulative properties in synthetic varieties that we do in wool. We don't have the same strength that we do in silk, except for nylon. Nylon's very, very strong. Um, but a lot of these things, again, are simply just used to make cheaper substitutes of our existing fabrics that were traditionally made out of uh, natural fibers. We can also include blended fibers, so we can blend in uh, different percentages of synthetic fiber with natural fiber to um, kind of have a little bit of a compromise to still have uh, some of the properties of our natural fibers while still making it cheaper. So synthetics are meant to be cheaper alternatives. Um, and again, they're pretty much all plastics and that's why they're so cheap because plastic is cheap. Um, it's cheaper to produce than a lot of our other natural fibers. Um, and again, we can blend them in to sometimes uh, just cheapen it um, or even give it uh, additional pro uh, properties like in spandex. So just to clear the air, all synthetics are made of plastic. That's, uh, uh, we don't necessarily like to say this in fashion um, because it's a, a plastic has a very sort of negative association with it. Um, especially these days, we're trying to get rid of plastics, but it is a plastic and all synthetic garments, even blended ones, uh, all synthetic fibers, all synthetic fabrics have the same problems associated with it that plastics do today. It does not deteriorate, it does not degrade, it sticks around forever, um, it pollutes our oceans, it pollutes our landfills, um, it is very dirty to produce, especially um, uh, synthetic fibers and fabrics um, produce a lot of wastewater, a lot of waste chemicals. Um, so it's unfortunate. So, um, you know, I was talking before that a lot of people like to use synthetic leather or synthetic fur as an alternative uh, to the natural thing because of their objection of it being taken from an animal. However, um, synthetic leather, synthetic fur um, is not without, it's not problem free. Um, it has all the same problems associated with any kind of plastic production, um, uh, which are much more kind of environmental than um, specific to, you know, an animal, right? But again, it's, it's a rock and a hard place a lot of times. What are you going to choose? Um, I think the, personally for me, I enjoy actual leather because it will degrade, um, but made from a cow or something that is, is you know, going to um, really as a byproduct. It's it's really wasn't bred for its skin or its fur. Um, and, you know, in any way, if you can um, ensure that an animal has a humane life, is killed humanely, their fur is humanely, I think that that is a better alternative than going to synthetics. Um, however, a lot of fashion designers push the moral issue um, I, and I think this is conjecture and speculation, I'm not sure, um, but they push this sort of moral objection to having it be made from animals simply because they like to use a cheaper fabric. Um, it allows them to substitute in a cheaper fabric. It's easier to work with, uh, it's easier to sew with, uh, it lowers their production costs so they can actually profit more from it. Um, whereas typically if they're going to create a luxury garment, they're expected to use high quality, real, non-synthetic uh, furs, fibers, whatever. Um, but 
if they are able to sort of take this this moral route um, they can say, oh, we're doing this because of, you know, it's good for animals and it's good for that, especially the whole thing with the vegan leather that's 100% marketing. Um, you know, sure, the vegan leather is not, ha doesn't have an animal product in it, but how many fish did you kill when those wastewaters were poured out into who knows where? Um, so, <laughs> you know, be wary of marketing, always be wary of marketing, understand how it's being used understand that it's never usually a black and white situation it's usually a lot of shades of gray uh whenever we're dealing with any sort of thing with the fashion industry and uh, of course the fashion industry has had a lot of bad impacts on the environment a lot of bad impacts on animals um and it's sort of our duty our personal responsibility as designers and consumers to understand it and um try to change it for better in the future all right anyways that's my little aside, my moral aside. In the end, it's up to you to figure it out for yourself in your own moral compass. Okay, so like I said, I'm really only going to look at a few types of synthetic fabrics that are very distinctive and are always made out of synthetic fa of, uh, fabrics and don't really have a natural fiber equivalent. Again, the broad majority of synthetic fibers and synthetic fabrics are really just made as um, alternatives or substitutions to all the other fabrics that we traditionally have. Um, but again, we're gonna look at some sort of specialty synthetics that we really only see with synthetics. And I'm gonna start with neoprene, which is a super fun fabric. Um, this is a thick, spongy, stretch fabric that was originally created to, uh, to make wetsuits. So when we think of like scuba suits or wetsuits that people wear sometimes when they're surfing or in cold water, um, this is the fabric that they use. Um, however, it's being uh, slowly but surely adopted by the fashion world um, for use in many types of garments. I'm typically seeing it in skirts these days. I actually have a neoprene skirt, um, but we can see it in jackets and, and different things like that. It's super durable, um, it's warm, and it does not fray. Uh, its thickness also gives the fabric great body, so it flares out in these really wide, voluminous flares. And we can see that in this skirt. Actually, the skirt I have is very similar to that. It's not exactly like that, but similar. Fleece. This furry fabric is created with synthetic fibers, uh, not the fleece of an animal. Um, although it can kind of look like it. It's also, it's not a velvet either. Um, so it's created a little bit differently than our typical velvets. Um, and uh, it's usually always 100% synthetic. Um, it's cozy and warm and sometimes called polar fleece. Now there's a lot of different sort of names for fleece, so for polar fleece, arctic fleece, blah, 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 blah. And like many of these synthetic uh, garments, they're kind of proprietary fabrics owned by a company that developed them specifically for use in their garments. Um, but fleece is sort of a general term made for any synthetic uh, fiber that kind of has this fluffy, um, furry uh, texture to it. Um, they are warm and often used for pullovers or zip ups and called fleeces. So if you say, hey, get me my fleece, um, we're typically talking about something like this. Um, and it was originally pioneered by Patagonia, um, but many, many other companies have created their own versions of fleece, uh, fleece fabric and fleece garments. Microfibers. So the term microfiber refers to any fabric made with synthetic fibers that were created to be ultra thin. And these are really the thinnest fibers available to us today. Uh, they must, to be classified as a micro, microfiber, they must be less than 10 micrometers in diameter. And that is super, super thin. It's thinner than even our other very, very thin silk fibers. These microfibers can give an array of special properties to fabrics depending on how they are woven. Uh, they can create fabrics that are very soft, very strong, or very stretchy. Um, now the fabrics themselves don't have to necessarily be very thin. Uh, they just have to use these very thin fibers in their construction. And we typically see things like um, microfiber suede, which is a very uh, thin synthetic alternative to suede that is very thin, it's very limp, it's very soft. Uh, we probably also see these uh, fabrics most used as cleaning cloths for glasses and camera lenses. 
Um, this is because the fine fibers used to create them are so soft and so thin that they do not cause any abrasion on these surfaces. Um, so again, camera lenses and glasses are very sensitive to any kind of scratching. So we use microfiber cloths to eliminate any type of abrasion that would be caused by other types of cloths. But again, we can see microfibers being used all across the board for many different types of fabrics. Gore-Tex. Gore-Tex is one of our most um, well-known high-performance synthetic fabrics, although there is a wide range of them, and I'll get to that in a little bit. So Gore-Tex was developed in 1969, and it really kind of pioneered the area of high-performance specialty synthetics. Um, it's completely waterproof, um, but that's not the amazing proof. It's completely waterproof while still being breathable. So it lets water vapor from the body escape and evaporate, but it doesn't let it in. It's sort of one-way moisture, uh, which was a really uh, br uh, groundbreaking uh, invention at the time. And this special property has made Gore-Tex a favorite fabric to use for any high-performance garment. So this is a tr trademark. So anytime you see a little TM mark, now I haven't done that here. I should TM, TM, trademark Gore-Tex. Uh, any sort of time you see a fabric with a TM, it is typically a high-performance fabric that was made by uh, material scientists um, and has a specific purpose within the high-performance realm. So, um, you know, uh, there's a list that you can look up of high-performance um, synthetic materials, and they all are specialized to do different things, whether it be for waterproofing or insulation or movement or whatever else. Um, I didn't, didn't want to go over them all today because I'd bore you to death, but you can look them up yourself, especially if high-performance fabrics and high-performance garments are something that you're into. Um, but again, and they're all typically uh, uh, created, um, and a lot of times created and developed by a specific company made for a specific purpose or garment, um, um, uh, very much like all high-performance garments are. Spandex, one of our favorite synthetics. So Spandex uh, is a brand name that is an anagram for expands because that's what it does. Uh, it's our only elastic fiber, um, but it's also known by other names like las uh, Lycra or Elastine. Uh, this fiber has really revolutionized the fashion industry with its elastic properties. So it's the only stretchy fiber that we have. Um, so we can blend it with other fibers to give stretch to um, typically unstretchy fabrics, um, or we can make full garments out of it, um, out of only spandex for super stretchy uh, garments. And it can be woven, it can be knitted, it can be finished differently, it can be embellished. Uh, we can get a, a variety of different fabric types, and weights, and finishes from spandex, but they all have in common the fact that they stretch. All right, that concludes um, our fabric series and uh, our video on skins and synthetics. Um, hopefully you have a better idea of uh, the world of fabrics and what you need to select for when collect, uh, designing your presentations and your collections. Um, and so I, I especially hope to see uh, much more informative information on your fabric boards when we do our collection presentations next week. Um, uh, so, you know, I don't want to see any pictures of a swatch with just the word cotton next to it. My goodness, you should know so much more about that fabric swatch by now. Um, uh, I will be grilling you guys, so if you do make the mistake of putting just the word cotton next to a picture of some cloth, I want to know what the weave is. I want to know if there's anything special about those yarns. I want to know what uh, fabric type it most resembles. Does it most resemble a poplin? Does it most resemble a batiste? Does it most resemble a chambray? Um, what about it? I want to know everything about it. Um, and again, it's very important for us as designers to know about our fabrics. Um, so keep that in mind and make sure that you know everything about your fabrics that you used in your collections, uh, have it 
presented on your fabric board, especially, especially if you used images of swatches instead of actual swatches. Uh, but in both cases, you should be knowledgeable about everything to do with your uh, fabrics. Um, so in relation to that as well, oh, that's where I got that image. I just want to go over our presentation dates for our second collection project. So we're going to begin with our open critiques on Monday. It's going to go the same as we did before. I'm going to email you a link to join. Um, and we're going to roughly follow this schedule. Again, there might be a little bit of change to it depending on who has what when um, and how much we can get through in one day. Um, so please, this is due on Monday. Uh, but please uh, try to email me your images. This is due for everyone on Monday. Uh, but please have your images of your collection sent to me an hour before class time so I can uh, prepare them for the uh, critique. Um, and this is our last project uh, for, school, uh, for during class time. Uh, we will not be doing the group project this semester. You will have one final uh, collection project. So again, this is for next week, your collection project two. And let's just, I'm gonna post uh, your final presentation as well. Let me just go ahead and find it so we can go over it. Your final project is uh, the same as all of our other uh, collection projects. It's just a little bit different. It's going to be due the 10th. There will be no open critique or presentation associated with it. Um, again, it's supposed to be done exactly the way as our other collection projects um, are done. You can do whatever price point, whatever customer, whatever market that you please. Um, in the final exam project, you're going to have 20 thumbnail sketches. That's um, uh, five more than your other collections and seven final sketches. So that's two more than your other ones. Again, mood and fabric board. Um, uh, fabric board should include all fabrics used in the garments for your final sketches and flats done for all garments in your final sketches. And in addition, since you are not going to be presenting, please include a brief written description of the collection that includes who your customer is, what price point your collection falls into, and why your collection appeals to your customer. Um, you'll email it to me by the 10th, of course. Uh, there will be no um, presentation required for this exam project. You can submit it early and be done early if you so choose. Um, but the 10th is the due date, the last due date we have, and it's the last date you will have to submit any other work for this class. Uh, if you have any other questions or anything else or want a little rundown on your grades so far, please let me know. I sent them out. If you are missing any assignments, please send them in. Uh, the grades that I sent you did not include any uh, missing assignments. That means they were totaled without including your missing assignments. That means that um, if you do not hand in those missing assignments, they will be included into your final grade and will be counted as a zero and dramatically affect your grade. So for instance, even if you're missing just one of that small magazine sketch or whatever, that missing 20 points can lower your grade by a full grade. So if you were going to get an A minus, you might get a B plus or B if you do not hand in that assignment. So email me to make sure that you have all your assignments in if you're, if you're, if you're wondering. Uh, make sure you do hand in all your assignments. We don't have a lot of assignments for this class. We have the magazine sketch, the flat assignment, the first collection, the select, second collection, and the final exam project. That's it. It's not a lot, so it should be easy to keep track of. Um, again, if you want a, a rundown, um, email me if you have any questions, email me, um, uh, but that's about it. So I'm going to wrap up and I'll see you guys on Thursday and we'll do um, some sketching, get back to sketching on Thursday. All right, guys. Bye-bye.